number on your screen. This evening, Books and Books, in collaboration with the University of Miami Center for the Humanities, is very happy to welcome Dr. Britt Brogard, presenting her book, The Superhuman Mind, Free the Genius in Your Brain, and here to host the rest of the evening for me. Please welcome our good friend, the director of the Center for the Humanities, Professor Miyoko Suzuki. Thank you very much. So I'm really, is it working? Yes. I'm very happy to welcome you to our final uh, Books and Books talk, and it's befitting our finale. It's a standing room only crowd. Um, and I'd like to let you know that next semester we'll start in, in September for another full series um, of eight book talks uh, next year. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to uh, welcome to the podium uh, my colleague and friend, Otavio Bueno, who is the chair of uh, the philosophy department and a colleague of Britt Brogard. Well, uh, welcome all. Uh, it is for me a great pleasure to, to introduce uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Britt Brogard. There are two kinds of philosophers. Um, one that fell in love with a little problem and they spend most of their career sort of going deep and deep down this little hole and seeing all complexities and issues there. This other philosophers are intellectually curious, uh, restless, and uh, want to see a larger landscape and are intrigued by interconnections that there are among a variety of different areas and issues. Um, I think in that kind of tradition you find a oh, good old René Descartes, right, who's a mathematician, a physicist, a uh, metaphysician, a philosopher of the mind, who developed a very original uh, system by exploring those connections in somewhat systematic way. Interestingly, he also did a bunch of experiments, even though he was a rationalist, right? Uh, he was too curious not to look at the way things are. Um, I think Brit belongs to that kind of tradition. Uh, and if you consider her work, uh, it involves exactly that kind of intriguing juxtaposition of different areas, different subject merits, and different approaches to think about philosophical issues. She has written extensively and widely uh, over issues from the philosophy of mind, philosophy of language, neuroscience, cognitive science, uh, epistemology, uh, as books that range from um, love, romantic love, all the way to transient truths, um, and everything in between. Right? So it's, uh, it's a powerful brain. Um, and it's not surprising that she also is intrigued by issues about our own brains. Right? Um, the book that she's going to talk about today, um, it's a fascinating reflection about all there is inside a human brain, in particular the very curious features uh, that some brains have. Capacity to do very unusual things. Uh, but one of the messages of the book is those, although, although somewhat different brains, are brains just like ours. Right? There is a sense in which a lot of the things that she reports in the book are things sometimes that happen by chance as the result of an accident, some brain uh, uh, injury of some sort, uh, sometimes by some unusual training, sometimes by just the way they are. Right? Uh, but what's remarkable about the book is the way in which the reflection about this plethora of abilities um, are grounded on the experiment, experiment, experimental side. Uh, of psychology, neuroscience, and a rich literature uh, of empirical investigation. So the book itself is an intriguing blend between the f sort of scientific reflection in data together with philosophical reflection about its significance. Uh, and what we get is actually a very uh, inspiring picture about all kinds of things we can do with our own brains, if you just treat them properly. With, without further ado, it's welcome and great to have Britt with us. Thank you. 
Thank you so much for the nice introduction. Uh, the, the superhuman mind uh, does touch on uh, philosophical issues uh, that I will not have time to present today. Um, it touches on, for instance, the issue of whether mental states, so for instance, if you perceive something, whether that is mediated by some other layer that could be, say, content uh, or some other uh, layer that would make it uh, not sort of in a direct contact to the world or whether you have this direct contact to the world which is also known as a naive realism. Uh, I've also argued that in many papers. Uh, what I'm going to focus on uh, today is uh, some of uh, our brain uh, case studies uh, that show that how brain injuries can lead to special abilities and also a little bit about a condition that I'll say a little bit more about uh, synesthesia. In the book, uh, we also talk about how people who don't want to take a hammer and <laughs> knock the head out um, <clears throat> can sort of acquire some of those abilities. So I'll leave most of that for the Q&A in order to present some of the more interesting case studies, some of which are actually very new. So, so here's a book. Um, so it's, it deals with, uh, so the, the, the title was actually our title. Uh, the subtitle was not our title. Um, but uh, the, the, the book does deal with ways that you can acquire, say, an enhanced memory or enhanced originality, enhanced creativity. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk a bit about the two things that reappear constantly in the book, a condition called synesthesia and another condition called savant syndrome. And uh, in the book, though I won't be able to present all the data for that, uh, we argue against a hypothesis that's called the 10,000 hour hypothesis, which basically says that if you, are, you, you want to develop a new skill, you have to practice for 10,000 hours. So if you think about it, that would be, if you did it like every day from morning to evening, that would be something like two to three years. And most people don't have that kind of time. So if you spread it out further, it might be 10 years. So pick up the violin, you would have to like practice maybe for 10 years. Or if you really had the time to devote, you would, you would do it for maybe three years, but from eight to five every, every day. Um, so, so that's a hypothesis that has been sort of was well, a psychologist that, that came up with it, but then it's sort of been popularized by Malcolm Gladwell and other people. And then, um, and then the, the more technical part of the book is that a neurotransmitter that is familiar to people from antidepressants, uh, serotonin, underlies some conditions, uh, both conditions, and its connection to autism. Now, I also have to say, I cannot go through all the slides because uh, we are trying to leave some time for, for Q&A. Okay, so synesthesia, I'll start with that. And that's, that is actually how my lab started before I got uh, the, the position at the University of Miami uh, two years ago. And the lab that I, I had at the time uh, so way back um, after I completed my postdoc at uh, ANU in Australia was the synesthesia lab. So synesthesia is this condition that is very unusual because it involves an abnormal uh, binding of senses or streams uh, within senses. Uh, so an example would be that you have music, for instance, and that would give rise to smell. So normally you don't smell music. Um, and other people uh, have, they, they hear music, they see colors, or they look at letters that are printed in black, and they see the specific individual letters as actually having specific colors attached to them. There are more fancy versions of synesthesia. Uh, you can have uh, pain synesthesia, so you might go to the dentist, and the dentist, this is an actual example from a synesthete, uh, the dentist might say, well, is that the tooth where you have your pain? 
And as soon as you say, no, the other, this next one, because that one is yellow. And so, so pain, uh, color synesthesia is another one. Um, there are also even more fancy ones where they sort of metaphorically say that they feel what other people feel. What they really have is sort of enhanced kind of empathy. So some doctors and nurses actually use that when they actually practice medicine and they um, they are able to empathize with the with the patient through their synesthesia. Um, <clears throat> so synesthesia wasn't taken seriously for a long time. It was actually uh, described very well uh, in the 1800s uh, and even before that in the literature that were examples of people with synesthesia. So people who had colors in response to hearing sounds or other things like that. <coughs> but then when we turned around 1900, a little bit before, which was when psychology broke off from philosophy, um, the tradition was to look at behavior or dispositions to behave in certain ways, also a tradition known as behaviorism. And since at the time we didn't have techniques to um, sort of investigate people who have internal states or internal feelings. Um, that was not a way, so synesthesia, how would, how would you investigate that in terms of people's behavior? Well, maybe there are ways, but it wouldn't be the obvious ways to do it. So most of the research before that relied on asking people. And they said, yeah, this, this musical note has the color red, right? But at that point, like verbal reports were sort of discredited. So behaviorism and synesthesia became an, a subject that you should not investigate. <coughs> then um, in around sort of 1980, 1980s, uh, techniques started to be developed such as uh, brain scans where you could look at people's brain from the inside uh, as well as there were sort of more sophisticated tests to test for this and synesthesia research and started to become sort of a discipline in, in research. Um, so, <coughs> so here's uh, just some examples of synesthesia that I described. So I'm going to uh, just go uh, to the next slide. Um, so, so what is it that makes uh, synesthesia sort of a real thing? as opposed to something that you imagine or a cultural reference. So we all have the association between synesthesia, I mean, sorry, between certain kinds of concepts and certain other kinds of concepts. So blue, right, that symbolizes sadness. Uh, so that's not synesthesia, that's sort of a cultural thing. And so you might go to other cultures where blue might not symbolize sadness. So that's not what synesthesia is. That is an association, but in synesthetes, it's much more of a tight connection. So there are two kinds of, of synesthetes. There are synesthetes that actually literally sort of see things outside themselves. So it is as if, it's not as if in an objective sense, it's as if in a sense that that where you say, well, yeah, yeah, in some sense they're wrong about what they're seeing. So if they see um, colors outside themselves in the visual field in response to music, you say, well, yeah, the music isn't really colored, but the the experience is still there, so they see it out in the visual field. And then there are also synesthetes who have it more in their head, so they have a concept, say, uh, of of a number, the number three. And that is sort of automatically bound to, the, the, say, the color green. And, and so uh, various ways that we investigate that is, uh, so for that one, for instance, with the, uh, with the letters and numbers that have specific colors, there is a, a so-called battery, which is a test uh, that where you have to pick not only like the color in the sense of blue, red, green, uh, which is the hue, but also the specific shade of that color. So you would go and you would have this ha uh, sort of a whole sheet with, uh, say, red, shades of red, right? So you pick a specific shade of red for a particular, um, say, number or letter, 
and and so you do that over and over and over again on the test and then later you represent that with say the number three let's just take that example and then you also present it with a little square with a color so say you pick like this particular uh, shade of green and then the little square will have maybe that particular shade of green or maybe a different shade of green and then you have that's a sort of a uh, response test so you have to quickly decide whether that was what you picked before so that's very a very reliable way of testing for some kinds of synesthesia um, now um, as I said of course there's, there are also uh, ways to to look at it in the in the brain I'm going to, to get to that slide in a second but <coughs> When you look at brain scans, uh, you can sometimes look at the visual areas of the brain, which are in the back of the head, actually, surprisingly, because the eyes are in the front, but the visual areas are in the back. And you can see that there are unusual connections between, say, the form areas of the brain that looks at like the shapes of the letters um, and, and then the color areas. So you can actually see those connections in the brain. Now, this is a, a, a standard test in psychology it's called the Stroop effect. What, what you see there is actually the standard test and not the test that we use. So what happens is that um, if you ask people to name the ink color of the uh, written word, so blue is written <coughs> in, in red, so they don't have to read blue. They just, they, they, you're asking them not to read blue. You're asking them to just tell you what is the color of the ink. And so people will, will go, okay, red, right, next one, blue, uh, red. But people will slow down because they can't help but read the word. And so they'll slow down. So we, we contrast that with a case where you are reading just black, blue, and black, green, and black, yellow, or, or even like blue printed in blue. And so you see that contrast. Now, in the case of synesthesia, what you're doing is, for instance, if, if you have, say, the letter B is, is blue for you, right? So we might present it as red on the screen, and, and we might show that um, when it's presented in the same color as you have your synesthesia, then you're more, you can more quickly name it uh, the ink color than you can that if, if it has, like, the contrary color. So that's sort of an... Uh, a case where that's considered a case of showing that it's a perceptual phenomenon um, because it's sort of also known to be like an intentional bias. So if you're distracted by something like when you, you, you happen to be blue and so it's hard for you to say red when you name it, it's an intentional bias uh, where your brain is trying to focus on a different task than it's asked to do. Um, <coughs> here's another uh, test in addition to ones I mentioned. So there are people with uh, that kind of synesthesia, also known as projector synesthesia, where uh, the, say, the colors of the letters are projected out into the world. If you ask normal subjects to look at this pattern, so this was one of the first ones that were done, now to much more sophisticated ones, um, <coughs> You can sort of see that if you look carefully, so these are fives and twos, you'll look, you'll search around, and then you'll find that the twos form a little triangle, and it will take subjects a, uh, a little while, but imagine that you have a synesthete who has um, the twos in red and the fives in green. Well, for some of them, it looks like that, right? You don't have to search. It just pops out, so the twos just pop out. And, and that also is taken to be an indicator that synesthesia can be sort of a real perceptual thing. In some sense, something you're seeing, not seeing in an accurate way, but seeing in the same sense as, as you might see something in an inaccurate way. Um, so here's just <coughs> and some an example of what I mentioned before, that you can have connections that are unusual between the form and, and color area of synesthesia. Um, so one might wonder, what are the advantages of synesthesia? How, how could that have survived uh, through generations uh, and generations? And of course, there's always the possibility that it's some, in some sense a side effect of something else. Um, but there's also a lot of evidence that it can improve memory. 
uh, and it can improve search skills. Uh, we can talk about in the Q&A how it can also serve as a warning mechanism. Um, now, I just want to men mention uh, this particular picture. This is not a super great picture because it's supposed to be a DIF file, which does not work in Google Slides. Uh, so what you, what you normally have is that you have a, a flickering between the two pictures, so not the one with the error, obviously. But you have one of those little leaves like flick in and out. And when you have normal subjects, uh, search through it. It actually takes um, up to a couple of minutes finding which little leaf it is that's, that's sort of disappearing and reappearing. Uh, we have uh, occasionally had uh, subjects, uh, even sort of unrelated to the synesthesia, be, they can just look at these and they can say, okay, that is, like right away. You could get lucky too. If I had shown the real world, you could get lucky too and you can like focus on it. But they can do it again and again and again. So if you have those kinds of search skills, I mean, that might be a certain advantage. Um, are the disadvantages of synesthesia? Well, um, there, there's, I'm just going to mention one. Uh, we have one subject, this goes back to when I was in Australia. Um, that was uh, an Australian subject. He had uh, responses, so color responses in his visual field to sounds that were so intense that if he was going, if he was passing a construction site or being in a very loud room, he would have so much color in his visual field that he literally couldn't see. It was, it's not like the color can still be transparent, but if there are enough of them, it's going to affect his vision. So he actually uh, had a sort of proof that he was legally blind in order to uh, be able to withstand um, various you know, constraints in his, in his life. So savant syndrome is a difficult thing to define. It, it used to be called something very derogatory, namely idiot savants. And uh, that's because people thought that people who had a very low IQ sometimes had a special skill in a special area. And later, the idiot was dropped from uh, idiot savants. And now it's called savant syndrome. So the way that we try to define it is instead of saying, OK, someone has this um, remarkable ability, which many of them do, uh, we define it in a way that's relative to the person's functionality. So if a person is low functioning but has an ability that maybe you can do that too, but if you are high functioning, then it's not remarkable that you can do that too. right? So we look at people's functionality and see if they have like one skill that sort of stands out relative to their functionality. Um, so here's just some historical cases. Uh, there was Blind Tom, who was a slave, and maybe that was to his benefit because his slave owner realized that he was remarkable in the, on, on the piano, and so he got to play the piano instead of slaving away. Um, he still was, was used, of course, but he probably had a better life than he would otherwise have. Uh, here's one that was in the media. So this guy was just taken on a helicopter ride uh, for 12 minutes uh, around London. And then he was getting, there's not a terribly good picture of it, but so he was uh, given sort of a, a round sketch of um, sort of similar to what he was seeing. And it turned out that he was almost precise down to the smallest details of windows. And so he has this skill compared to that he's almost not able to, to speak um, and has sort of a severe case of like low functioning autism. Um, these twins have also been in the media. Um, they have many remarkable skills. But one that can be objectively checked is that they, they, they're very low functioning, so they're sitting on their couch and they're watching television um, game shows. And uh, for since they started doing that, which they've done for maybe 20 years, you can just pick an arbitrary date, say January 15th, 2004, and they can tell you exactly what the host of that game show was wearing. Um, and, and so, so I'm mentioning that they can do a lot of other stuff too, but that one is something you will you can just scroll back right in the in the game shows and see oh yeah they were right. Um, Oliver Sacks also describes some twins that were just sitting in the corner of the library and 
could not do much more, so very low functioning, but they were able to come up with this that was stealing. They're competing about like who could come up with the highest prime number. And all of the sex was reporting that, well, they were like up to six digit prime numbers. And you know like how hard that would be to like figure that out what a prime number was would be like. And here's a here's another one that's um famous because it was the inspiration for for Rain Man. Um so that's Kim Peek. Who is quite remarkable? So he inspired the the movements and so on of the main character in the Rain Man. That was why he's on the set there. And he he actually uh, was sort of uh, the the modern day DPS. Um, unfortunately, he died young, um, relatively young. He was in his fifties um, a few years ago, and he he. <coughs> was able to tell you almost sort of any two cities in the world if you want driving directions. Um, he could tell you how to get from one city to the other. Uh, he was sitting in the library most of his day uh, and just reading and absorbing everything. So if you didn't have the DPS, which we didn't have at the time, or at least some of that time, you could have taken him on the ride. Uh, also, Daniel uh, Tamet is uh, famous for, um, he, he's the author of Born in a Blue Day. He holds a record for reciting pi to 24,000 decimal points. And he holds the European record, which is not even the record, the world record is actually more like 64,000. Um, <coughs> so what do they have? Um, all have in common? Well, all of them have in common that they have autism, except uh, the one case of Kim Peek. He actually didn't have autism. He was lacking the three connections that connect the two sides of the brain to each other. So he's, he's lacking those. There's still information that can pass through underlying areas, so-called subcortical uh, areas of, of the brain. But it's said, how exactly that was done, we don't know, but it was said that he was reading two pages at once. So he would always read like one page and the other page at the same time in a book when he was sitting in the library. We don't exactly know how that um, took place. Okay, so some of our uh, case, case studies. Uh, so here's one, this is, um, this is an image from uh, a Nightline uh, ABC's Nightline clip. Uh, this is the subject. He was a farmer as he fell down a mountain in Colorado while feeding chickens. Was caught by a tree. Luckily, otherwise, he probably th would have died. Was caught out the tree, taken with the helicopter to uh, a trauma hospital. They, she was partially, she had some spinal fractures, but not partial spinal fractures, so she could recover her mobility. So they were primarily focused on that. But Afterwards, he had no interest in farming, and she just started obsessing with drawing. So these actually drawings, um, you can see a lot more online uh, if you go search for Lee Asek. Um, I should also say that uh, we're allowed to use the full name of the subjects when they're public <coughs> subjects, so there's no privacy um, broken here by doing that. Uh, in her case, um, also, she lost um, an ability to interpret emotions and and so in this case it was like he, her amygdala which is sort of the uh, one part of the emotional brain seems to be working fine but the part of the prefrontal cortex seems to not be able to interpret her emotions and <coughs> that is also known in uh, in other contexts to be able to when that is damaged it seems that other bra uh, parts of the brain can take over and overcompensate for that and so that might have been her um, sort of way into drawing. Here's, um, here's a very recent one that we, we don't have a, a, a lot of data on her. Um, she was unusual in that her case was not a brain injury, uh, but it was a, an extreme stress reaction. And so we don't exactly know how, we know that the stress reactions you had produced a lot of adrenaline, which is actually two to three times more than people who have a heart attack and up to 20 th times as much as people have normally. Uh, we also know that adrenaline cannot pass through the from the blood to the brain. 
Um, but there is actually evidence that in the periphery that it can affect the brain. So we have, she's a very new subject. But she started painting. She was a realtor before. And she just came in yesterday. Um, I'll skip that uh, for now. Um, here's the one. She came in today. Very new. Uh, she had a skateboarding accident. Uh, and, um, and she was into sports. Uh, she was into um, business communication with a major, and then she again took up art. It was mostly what you can see right now because it's very new, so we haven't really looked closely at her. Is that she has this uh, sort of obsession again uh, with with poetry and art, and um, and also reading. She suddenly had an interest in reading before she did not have an interest. So she's reading everything. Uh, and she's obsessed, she will wake up in the middle of the night and, and just start reading stuff because she's so obsessed with reading things like like about historical figures and ancient philosophy even, um, even though she has no philosophical background. Um, so uh, again, it, it seems that when you affect the, the, part, the frontal part of the brain, you can have the compensation in other parts of the brain. Oh. Derek Amato <coughs> is, um, is, is another uh, case study of ours. So we have had a little more of a chance to look closer at his case. Um, so he was just the salesperson, and he was playing balls. He also liked sports. And he was playing balls just for fun uh, at a sort of pool party with his friends. And uh, he, was, he was sort of trying to catch the ball, so he was diving into the shallow end of the pool by accident because he mistook the shallow end for the deep end. And luckily, he didn't get paralyzed. But after the three days of recovering from uh, the traumatic brain injury, uh, so which was something like a concussion, he was again drawn to, uh, in this case, to the piano. Now, we don't know what it sounded like when he sat down after the first three days and he sought out his friend who had a piano and he wanted to play the piano. We don't know what it sounded like. But what we do know is that it didn't take that many years before he was uh, recording albums and was invited to tour around America playing his music. Uh, so a couple of years later, he basically was doing that. Um, he, has, um, he has a lot of... Um, uh, Brain injuries which make it harder uh, to find out exactly what the mechanism is. Um, <coughs> let's skip that. Um, I'm going to look at, at this. Um, is, this is the Stroop test thing. We talked about the Stroop test earlier. That was a red when, when the word blue was written in red or vice versa. Now, this is a test that has been used in. Um, most prominently in people with an uh, eating disorder. So in people with an uh, eating disorder, you use it in some, some sense as a, as a test of obsession. So in that case, you have words. Uh, on, so you have a list of words. And then you have the, uh, again, you have them printed in different ink colors. Uh, so with the eating disorder, which is not something we completed, you might have on one sheet, you might have pizza, burgers, steak, um, and then, but they are supposed to read the ink color. They're not supposed to think about steak and pizza and, and burgers. And then, you know, of course, you would have like mat words that were matched in length and frequency and so on, um, matching those. And then you would look at that, that, that would be like airplane or car, things that have nothing to do with food. And then you would show, see how they slow down when they have the, the food words. And so that has been used as a measure of obsession with food. And so we sort of adopted uh, that test uh, just in the case of, uh, so, that, so this, is, this is an example. So we, use, we don't use that uh, Google Slides to do our, our things. We use E-Prime. But this is an example. So you would have the music words. And then. Um, the task is to name the ink color. The task is not to read the words. But again, if something is sufficiently interesting to a person, they will slow down when they have to name the ink color. 
And so the idea is, okay, I do these music words, slow the person down compared to uh, ideally, oh, I guess we already went to, so here are the uh, music words, right? And then you would have words that are matched for length and ideally also uh, how frequently they occur in the language. And then see like there's a slow you down when you see music words, which is an indicator of obsession. Um, okay, so the other way. Let me just talk uh, briefly about uh, Jason Padgett. So he was um, somebody wanted his wallet and they knocked him on the head. And uh, right after he developed this ability to see geometrical patterns in, in the world. And eventually he also, um, he was a college dropout. He didn't have any math experience, but he, he became obsessed with math and also with drawing. So his was, his, his was, I'm gonna skip this. But here's some of his drawings. So these are hand-drawn images. So he was drawing some of the things that he was seeing. Um, uh, sort of in the world, and we'll talk more about that. What we did was, uh, he did go back to community college to learn a little bit of uh, of math, and he started like lining up those geometrical images that he was seeing. Somehow they became linked to a mathematical formulas. So what we did was we tested him on something that looked like mathematical formulas, but which were not mathematical formulas, so ill-formed formulas, basically. And you can see this, so this is sort of what we call the baseline. And then you subtract that from what you get from the formulas, and what you get is this. And what's interesting here is actually how left-sided it is, is one thing that's very interesting, uh, which is common in people with savant syndrome from birth. So not left-sided, actually it's more usually more right-sided, but it's very, very left-sided. It's more left-sided than any other thing that you can get from an individual on any other task. It's like, it's basically, there's no right-side activity there in handling um, the synesthesia. Another thing that's interesting that surprised us was that there was no activation in the visual areas in the back of the head. But then we read about some studies from Daniel Tammet that I mentioned earlier and they found, also they also found no activation in the visual cortex, and they called it, uh, at that point, they called it sort of a higher form of synesthesia. Okay, we, we did uh, we put a big magnet on his head, which can either stimulate your brain, which uh, we describe in the book too, that you can make people draw better and so on. You can make people um, do, be better at math if you do a li little bit of, put a little bit of magnetism on the head. You can do that. If you put a lot of magnetism on the head, you can sort of induce at what we call a virtual lesion. So you can actually numb the brain <laughs> for just a couple of minutes. And so that's what we did because we wanted to numb those areas we found that was processing the synesthesia. And what we found was that with the synesthesia then disappear if you numb those areas. And you do that in order to get more than just a correlation. So you get that it sort of something closer to a causal uh, relation between the two. Um, uh, very briefly, because I'm running out of time, but uh, one of the, I mean, the mechanism, which we can talk about in the Q&A if people are interested, uh, is basically has to do with, um, in the case of brain injury, has to do with a lot of neurotransmitters that are actually released from dying neurons. And uh, so when you, whenever you have even a concussion, you have dying neurons and you have these neurotransmitters that are released. And these neurons, that's, that's well investigated. But that hyperactivates the brain and it's possible during that period that you can, c you can actually create um, new connections uh, between neurons and possibly gain access to areas that you did not have access to. I'm not going to talk, uh, uh, I already said something about the 10,000 hour hypothesis. This is only one indicator that the 10,000 hour hypothesis is wrong because these subjects come out of brain injuries that were normal, ordinary subjects before, and suddenly they can do all these things. But we have obviously other cases of normal subjects doing things in faster ways than 10,000 hours. Um, last thing I just wanted to mention. <laughs> Um, 
uh, our, our, our drug studies, we, we, we use the drug studies. In fact, uh, we have not yet gotten them approved at University of Miami. But um, it's very hard because what we use are, are drugs that are Schedule One illegal, Schedule well, Schedule One substances are illegal. Um, so you'd have to get them approved as uh, new investigatory drugs. So I'm working with someone from the medical school who has uh, used other uh, kinds of drugs that were Schedule One substances. Uh, but before that, when I was in my previous position, I worked with some people at Johns Hopkins Hospital, and the good thing was it already had the permission from the FDA and the DEA and uh, to use these drugs and so what we what we, we did what we looked at um, how the drugs can actually do various things they can induce a lot of the same conditions so they can induce synesthesia well obviously that sort of uh, has some connection to the hallucinations so these are uh, psychedelic drugs right so they, they induce synesthesia and hallucinations but what's also surprising was that in some cases they also introduced something that was more long-lasting. So after one session of exposure to these drugs, they were uh, suddenly becoming more uh, open in the personality sense of open, which means more artistic, um, more spiritual, uh, had more of a sort of interest in exploring poetry, art, and so on. And uh, this is the most technical slide, um, but that's one way that this drug could uh, work and that has some connection to how we think that other uh, forms of disturbed vision might take place. So there's a, an area of the brain, you don't have to go into the details of all this, but there's an area of the brain that, that the thalamus, which is controlling attention, it basically is an area of the brain that make sure that you don't get an overflow of information coming into your brain. Because if you get like everything coming into your brain, like everything like from the feeling of the seat you're sitting on to uh, the shoes that might be a little bit too small and, and the thoughts about earlier today, if everything comes into the brain all at once, you can't deal with that. So the thalamus is good because it's a gate. It closes, so it only lets some information in. But then this drug can inhibit what is already inhibited. In other words, it opens the gate. And in comes all the information um, that is not supposed to come in, and that's sort of a mechanism that might be giving rise to at least the hallucinations and then possibly also the synesthesia. All right, so uh, this is something we can talk about in the Q&A, and I'll stop here So, in order to have time for Q&A. <laughs> I would prefer if somebody else does okay. because I, I might not notice who is the hands up. Oh. Yeah. First of all, I thought it was a very interesting <coughs> talk. I have a lot of questions, but on two of them, one, I saw you had one of the slides on Alzheimer's. <coughs> yeah. And have you done any research on that? And there's, and with the non connections and the issues there? <coughs> uh, so we haven't done any research on Alzheimer's. So the slide that I sort of skipped was because there are two kinds of uh, dementia. Uh, one is Alzheimer's that affects memory, the memory center for memory, the hippocampus specifically. There's another kind of dementia that a lot of people also get, and sometimes they, they, it's hard to distinguish them, which affects like the, the side of the brain and also the frontal areas. And a lot of these people, uh, when they start developing it before they lose language and eventually also lo actually lose memory, um, they actually have an in inhibition of uh, very often the left side, uh, which is why they lose the language uh, language abilities, which is in the left side, and then they they start um, uh, developing because the left side is actually the boss of your brain, so that actually controls and suppresses your activity in your right side of the brain. So some of them actually get this uh, increased activity connectivity in the, in certain areas of the right side of the brain. And you will see that many of them actually take up painting. Um, so that was the the uh, the connection to it. That um, in in some of the cases of brain injury, that's the same thing that we see that they the people if they hurt the left side, you have it's like you know you kill the boss, and then you know you the rest the underling can flourish. And then on the other question, I had, if I'm thinking about like panic attacks. 
Have you ever looked at that? Because a lot of people, when they have those panic attacks, everything becomes intense. And it yeah. Fear and so, yes. Is there any uh, relation to that? There, there are several relations. So there was the one with the, uh, the stress condition. That said, there was the, the one subject we have where it seems directly caused by that adrenaline, which you also get during the panic attack. Um, so her, we just use a fancy word for it, but it's, it's a kind of panic attack. It's, it's also a slight weakening of the heart muscle, it's reversible. And so, so yes, so there's that connection that we saw specifically in one subject, but there's also, it's also uh, well known, there's lots of data on that, that if you look at um, the population of artists, if you take like a population survey of just artists, uh, there'll be way more people with anxiety and depression compared to the normal population, which is already high enough in the normal population. And also, if you go the other way around, so you take you know population depressing uh, individuals and people with anxiety, and you'll see more people actually having artistic talent. So, so there's those two links between, yeah. Yeah, um, you know, even I was thinking as we we're talking, and, and thanks for coming. Um, even for people who don't have necessarily special gifts, you know. I, I've always thought most people in this world have so much more capacity <laughs> to express intelligence than they use in everyday life, and that people use so little of their brain. And it's because there's this, often there's a social stigma against the combination of being super smart and really enthusiastically kind of showing it. Like you can do yeah. one or the other, you can do your best if you're not that smart, you can be really smart if you don't show it that much. So I guess the answer to that is maybe this would help everyone be smarter, is that the people who were smart acted like everyone else and got together and unified and really demanded their social rights. I'm not talking about when someone's economically successful and like Bill Gates, they become a doctor. But socially, people should, it's such a wonderful thing as a human to have this ability to use your brain, and yet it's so socially, you always hear on NPR or whatever, people apologizing for being a nerd. I'm sorry, I'm smart, forgive me. And it should be the reverse. Yeah. That's my speech. I mean, yeah, that, that is in uh, in my native country of Denmark, there is something called the Yentu Law, which is actually that if you are, like have any advantage, it doesn't have to be intelligence. It could be, I mean, in a standard IQ sense, uh, it could be like you're really good at sports or anything. Well, just keep it quiet because <laughs> you're supposed, not supposed to let anyone know. But yeah, so, well, w just one, follow-up remark, there are probably are a lot more people with these conditions that we actually know about. And then may, it could be due to what you're saying, it also just be due to um, a bias in who respond to the ads and so on, um, in terms of like, oh, I have this. Um, I, she's building questions. Uh, you, were, you were talking about all these injuries seem to be sudden impact injuries that produce yeah. all this intelligence. Uh, National Football League and football players have been in the news lately. These are repetitive, and they yeah. seem to do the opposite of that. that have we done any studies on that? Uh, not really. We had, we had one, one person uh, who had um, a baseball accident where a ball actually hit him, where he had, he had these advantages as well. But it should be said that um, don't go out and knock your head against the wall because in most cases you don't get any advantages <laughs> at all. <laughs> uh, I've been there. I didn't get any advantages. And I didn't purposely knock my head against the wall. Um, but so in most cases, no, you don't. You, um, and so, so the question then arises, when does that happen? And we, that, that's something that we're still working on, but the location can matter. It also actually depends on how excitable your brain already is. So is your brain more excitable or is it less excitable, right? So brains that have a different level of excitability um, as would take longer to explain. But it, it obviously, we have different levels of individual excitability plus the location matters. So it's rare that you uh, sit at the right location and also have a, a, a brain that's excitable enough. So, yeah. Uh, what what are the practical applications of this research? Is it did, is it uh, moving towards dealing with things like schizophrenia, multiple 
personality <coughs> does it have? I mean, it's very interesting to study all these cases. Yes. But where and does the book deal where it's what the end result is going to be of this research? Uh, the personal personality is actually my next project uh, because we do we do see these personality changes as well. But the book is not focused on personality. We do mention the personality changes in the book. That's not the focus in the book. The f focus of, of this book, as opposed to my next book uh, project, uh, is on how can you enhance a brain. And of, co of course, what I presented here were people who accidentally enhance their brain. But there are methods. So uh, one person at ANU uh, Dr. Snyder was using these magnets to cure people who have weaknesses, well, temporarily cure people who have weaknesses in mathematics and also um, to improve people's drawing abilities. So the idea is how can you make the most of your brain? And it doesn't have to involve magnets put on your brain. So in the book, we also talk about just ways that to think about things differently such that your memory will be enhanced. So there are ways that you should um, sort of encode memories that are better than others. It's something that's pretty widely known in the area of cognitive psychology, but it's something that we wanted sort of to make people aware of in the public that, okay, so here's like more deep processing of memory which will enhance your memory or you can just superficially try to remember something and you won't remember later or m for long. So the book is more on how to, how to make a better, better use of your brain. Then we start off with these exotic examples of people with brain injuries, but then we go into cases of people, uh, just ordinary people who enhance their memory. And we also go into people who lack a sense, so who are blind or deaf, and how they make use of different techniques in order to, so, so the blind people who use echolocation just like dolphins and submarines and so on, to by clicking the tongue and so on, and they, they use a the hearing to induce a kind of visual schematic imagery um, of their surroundings. So in, if they, can, they can see in some sense through hearing. So you could call it a kind of imagination, but it sort of has that correspondence to reality that imagination does not necessarily have. So the book, that book was focused on that. So how to make the most use of your brain. But the next natural step is, well, what about these personality changes, right? I mean, how can, can we also change our personality? What if I want to be more kind or if I want to be uh, more open to artistic experiences or spiritual experiences. Can I just sort of do that? That person? Yes. Yeah. Do you have any cases um, of people who had brain tumors or after surgery of tumors being removed or the trauma that comes from the surgery? So, yeah, so we don't have cases of that. That is um, the person who... Uh, Started, uh, he actually wrote the foreword to the book as well. Um, Del uh, Trevor, so Dr. Trevor, they just started a whole center. He's documenting this on his site. So he's a neurologist. And so he hasn't done any of the research except by asking people. He's documented a whole bunch of those cases, but hasn't done sort of the brain research behind it. But he does document a lot of them by sort of talking to people and having them in his practice a way that, you know, maybe more like what a psychiatrist might do, but he's a neurologist of, of training. And so he has this, they just open a center uh, where he can do more of that. Um, so he doesn't do the brain, the brain research or the theoretical speculations about how it happened, but just sort of documenting it. So he has, he's documenting all of these cases and, um, so Trafford is his name. He's, he wrote the foreword to the book. Yeah. That, that person. person. That person. Me? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, can you briefly make note of some techniques or practices that normal people can use? <laughs> 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 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm looking at the title of your book. And, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, there's there's a lot. We we we, uh, we 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 give a lot of the techniques, and the, and the, a lot of the techniques have been used for 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 many many years by people who do so-called um, memory sports. Uh, and uh, so one technique, for instance, is that you need to create an association with something that's meaningful to you. So say that <coughs> you really wanted to remember the number pi which is not necessarily something you want to remember, but I could give a better, more natural example. But if I want to remember the, the number pi, which I, I did on my way back from Scotland, well, no, actually I couldn't remember pi, right, because it's inf in infinite. But, um, but, you know, so we all know like 3, 1, one 4, 1, 5, and then next to like 92. So I, what I thought about was like, oh, what was my first day like in Australia when I did my postdoc? Oh, I actually came to to the building there, and the guard looked like really old. He looked like he was 92. Um, and so those were the next two. And so I went into my office, and um, I started working on a, on a fresh strip. It was often like it was related to people who were 65. And so the next two were 65. And then I talked to. It's a kind of association. What they actually do is that they use more than that. So they they lay out. Uh, the narrative, but they also use like emotional events. So it was not arbitrary that I used the first day. So here's an example from uh, someone who actually has competed in memory sports that we also talk about in the book. So he takes a really simplified example in order to illustrate this. So let's say that you have a really bad memory, so you can't remember three grocery items and you have to go to the supermarket. And so you need to, uh, uh, so, so your mom is saying like, oh, you really have to remember to buy milk red wine and oranges, right? And so that this is example. And so um, so in order to memorize that, you start in the kitchen in your house and then there's this waterfall of milk, which is supposed to be absurd, so you get the emotion of absurdity together with the location. So it has a location and it is in the kitchen. You walk into the living room, the red wine bottle is scattered all over and the red wine is looking like blood flowing between the broken glass in the living room. Okay, again, this is a scary, so you invo invoke the emotional part, but you also have a location for it because you need, you need, you need, you need the order right too, right? I mean, in, in this case, not with the grocery list, but in another case, you need the order right. And then you, may, you might go out on, uh, on your front porch or your, your terrace in the back, and, and then you see these little oranges that look like little cartoon characters making like little faces something like that. So so that would just be three items. But yeah, this kind of associations, but it's invoking specifically um, a path so you can remember the order, which is not important in the case of a grocery list, but it might be important in other cases. Um, they have locations in the landscape, and you have the emotional elements such that eventually it becomes internalized, and just like going into the kitchen in your mind will invoke, oh, absurdity, oh, waterfall, oh, milk. Um, so that would be a technique that, uh, that was explained to us directly from people who won some of the memory Olympics. And these are guys like, like the born savants who, who can really recite the number pi to 64,000 decimal points. Um, so, so yeah, it does require training, but it's, it's training, it's, it's deep processing of the information as opposed to superficial. So just rehearsing is not going to keep help you th remember things for the long term. So you, if you try to remember a phone number, it's not going to help to just say, okay, so if my phone number is 305-877-7353, you know, so, and then you keep repeating that. Well, that's, that's superficial processing. You need deep processing. So an, another method is chunking, where you put things in chunks, um, which is kind of like, uh, something you can do similar to what I said when I was trying to remember pi. So in, in my dad's phone number, uh, the three digits 911 appear. Well, 911, right? So there, there you have a chunk because the memory, working memory and long term memory, in terms of like encoding long term memory, can only remember originally they said about seven digits. It turns out to be more like four or digits or units, right? Um, but if you chunk them together, so, so if you have 9-11, that seems to be three units. If you chunk them together, it's one unit. And so you can remember more things like that.
So that would be an example of enhanced memory. Chris, I think we're out of time. I'm really sorry because mm -hmm. the questions were fabulous, but we all need to talk, right? Yeah. So, uh, mm -hmm. Thank you.